Welcome to Wow or Women of Worth. I'm Michelle Martin. She's a developmental biologist whose lectures reach the level of performance. Dr. Alison Woolard is the fifth female scientist ever to be part of the Royal Institution's Christmas lectures. Shall we see a protein in action? Ollie, are you there? Thank you. Come on down. Stand and show the audience your wonderful machine. So I understand this is a vein viewer. Yeah. So I guess we're going to be able to view veins. Is that right? Should we give it a go? Can I have a look at your arm? Ah, here we are. Do you mind if I just... With this machine, we can actually look inside Ollie's body without chopping him up, which is just as well, really. Can you see that? So this is the blood inside Ollie's veins. And this is an incredibly useful machine because when people are learning to take blood in hospitals, they can use this to see exactly where a patient's veins are without poking them around with a needle. So this is a really, really clever machine. And what we're looking at here is this haemoglobin protein from brains to worms, cells to organs, the university lecturer in genetics who gained her PhD under Nobel laureate Sir Paul Nurse brings science to the level of understanding of the layman in line with the Royal Institute's mission of connecting people to science. We welcome to the WOW Club, Dr. Willard. How are you, Professor? <laughs> I'm very well, thank you, and it's great to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about your perspective of these Christmas lectures? You attended one of these lectures at age 12. So what, is, what was your perspective at age 12 of these lectures and versus your perspective now, of course? Ah, well, my, my perspective at age 12 was that I didn't really understand all the science that was being talked about in the lecture, but I kind of knew that it was cool. You had to win a prize to gain a seat there, right? Well, it was because I'd done well in some school exams that I was allowed to go. And it was very exciting to be in the Royal Institution because I'd seen the lecture theatre on the TV and so it was, it was a really good day out. Um, but what struck, what stuck with me was the fact that it was so inspirational and aspirational in mm. terms of thinking that, you know, maybe one day I could do something like that. And then I kind of forgot about the Christmas lectures, really. I watched them over the years, occasionally. Um, and then when the Royal Institution contacted me to see if I'd be interested in, in doing one, I was amazed because I thought I would never be the sort of person they would want to do that. And it sort of, you know, completely reignited my interest in, the whole, in, that, in that whole important work that the Royal Institution do. Tell us a little bit about the initial reticence to take it on. You say you're not the sort of person to do that, but I've read headlines where you say, I've got the performance bug. Hey, well, I do now, <laughs> um, mainly because I'm really, really busy. So I'm a, I'm a full-time university academic. Um, I do research, teaching, and I have kids as well. So I have a busy work life and a busy family life. And I just wasn't quite sure how I would squeeze all this extra stuff into, into my timetable, but... You know, when I stopped to think about it for a, for a while, I kind of thought it was really worth doing and there must be a way of doing it. When you develop your Christmas lectures, which, by the way, are highly interactive and, and uh, it's difficult to look away. It's like a TED talk almost, you know. Mm -hmm. it really, yeah, exactly. It really draws into your subject matter, which can be so complex, uh, whether you're talking about a single cell organism or, or how our, our organs work. Mm -hmm. uh, can you share with us a little bit about what comes to mind, about what you want to communicate with the audience? What's foremost on your, on your mind when you develop your Christmas lectures? A sense of wonder. So that's really what gets me out of bed in the morning. And I think that's what get, all, gets all scientists out of bed in the morning. It's, it's this wonder about trying to understand the world around us. And we all do that in different ways, whether we're biologists or chemists or physicists or mathematicians. But that's the aim. It's, to, it's this sense of wonder and this passion to sort of tell other people about what we find exciting that is, is, the thing, is the thing that you need to communicate to other people. Her research focuses on the developmental biology of the nematode worm. Why? We find out more about her work and her life. Dr. Alison Woolard on The Wow Club after this. Add to your wow factor with Michelle Martin in the Wow Club on 938 Live.
Welcome to Wow or Women of Worth. I'm Michelle Martin. My guest this evening, a scientist who has the knack of taking the complicated and reducing it to simple lessons that even children can understand. Researcher Alison Woolard is the Royal Institution's Christmas lecturer. She was here in Singapore recently, and at the end of this show, you'll find out how you can catch her work on Channel 5. Dr. Woolard tells me more about her work and her life. Headlining the Singapore Science Festival Star Lecture Series. Mm -hmm. What did you want to bring to the Singapore audience? So for the Singapore audience, it's a sort of condensation of the three Christmas lectures. And so I've chosen what I think to be the most important story um, that sort of weaves all this material together. And that's about how organisms develop from a single cell to a very complicated multicellular organism. So we have 40 trillion cells inside us. Cells are the basic building blocks of life and yet we all start off as just one cell so somehow we need not just to build up these huge numbers of cells but each cell has to know what to do so we've got cells in our liver that do the right thing for liver and we've got brain cells that know that they're neurons and they have to do a particular job and we've got skin cells that need to provide a barrier and so on and so on and all of our cells contain the same sets of genetic instructions because it's all controlled by DNA and all of our cells contain the same DNA. So how do cells know what to do? How do they interpret those instructions differently in order to make an organism that works? Because indeed, if we understand how cells work, how they divide, what are the rules that govern uh, cell death, for example, could we hold back life? Uh, could we hold back um, death? Well, <laughs> yes, and we are, and we are already starting to do that, aren't we? Because one of the things that's really important about understanding how cells work is understanding how cells can sometimes go wrong. Mm. So one of the really important ways in which cells um, can go wrong is one of the things you mentioned about death. If cells don't die at the right time and they stay alive for too long, then that can be a problem. And if cells divide too much, then that can be a problem too. And both of those things can cause cancer because that's when cells go out of control and you can get tumours forming. I was wondering if you could help us understand a line of cells I came across recently called the HeLa line of cells mm -hmm. derived from the tumour cells of Henrietta Lacks who died in 1951, a poor black tobacco farmer. And her cells were, were taken without her permission at that time because it, you know, it wasn't required. Permission mm -hmm. wasn't required at that time. And it's become a highly commercialised line of cells. Mm -hmm. uh, so amazing because they're said to be immortal. They mm. defy the rules that uh, scientists before had struggled with when it came to using cells for experimentation. I understand they were spending so much more time trying to keep the cells mm -hmm. alive than actually experimenting mm -hmm. with the cells, which is something that the HeLa line mm -hmm. um, helped them overcome. Why was it that Henrietta Lacks cells were able to do what no cells before could, and that is remain stable after more than 51 divisions or so? Well, yeah, the, the, so those cells were derived from a cancer. They were from a tumour. And um, scientists before hadn't realised that if you took cells from a tumour, then they would just grow really well in the lab because they've got no breaks on them. They've, not, they've got no controls. They don't know when to stop. If you take one of your normal cells say from your skin or something, it'll divide a few times and then it'll stop it. It'll undergo a process called senescence, which is when cells just know that it's time to pack it in and not go any further. But cancer cells, they just don't do that. That control process goes wrong and they carry on and on and on and on and on. And so now there's lots of these cell lines that are derived from cancers that people use in the lab because they're very easy to grow and they're easy to keep happy. Um, and, and the HeLa cells are, are, are one of the first examples of those kinds of cells. But don't the cancers within the cells contaminate whatever it is you're studying? Well, that's a really important thing that scientists must always be aware of. Then whatever cell line you use for your experiments, you need to know that it's got particular properties that might make it not the best model for what you're studying. So scientists will use a wide variety of different cell lines and they'll also use what we call primary cell lines as well which are cells that only have a very finite lifespan, but they, they're, they're useful because they tell you more about how normal cells work. Are we any closer towards understanding the, what switches the cells um, off in terms of being able to proliferate tumour cells? Yeah, we are. I mean, there, there are, the answer is there, there are lots of things that are needed. There's lots of control points because when you have something so important as a cell knowing when to stop dividing, you don't just leave that decision to one thing. You have lots and lots and lots 
um, like a board of directors in the cell, you know, instructing the cell what to do. Um, so it's very complicated. But we do know a lot of the players now. We do know what a lot of these um, control points are. So take us back to your journey in science. You mentioned at age 12, you won uh, a prize that enabled you to be part of the audience for a Christmas lecture. So you're already doing uh, pretty well in science at age 12. Mm. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the point where you realized this was going to be what you're going to spend your life doing? Do you know, it, well, at school, I was I was a bit of an all-rounder. So I was quite good at lots of different subjects. And I was interested in lots of different things as well. And I think... It wasn't clear to me at school that I was definitely going to be a scientist because I was interested in languages and I was interested in history as well. And so when I was thinking about what to do at university, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to specialise in. Um, So my, my dad suggested to me that I try out working in a lab just to see if I liked it. And that's what I did. And that's when I realised that that's what I wanted to do. Because it was just so fascinating to go into the lab in the morning and, and see something new, see something that no one else had seen before. And that's what that's the bug that bit me. Why is the nematode worm important to understand? Ah, well, the nematode worm C. elegans, which is the worm that I work on, is a very simple organism. It only has about a thousand cells. It's a soil dwelling nematode. It's about one millimetre long. Um, And the reason that we use it to understand biological problems is because it's very simple. But at the genetic level, it's remarkably similar to us. So we share, you know, more than half of our genes with with a worm. And there there are other model systems that people use as well. People use the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. They use zebrafish. They use mouse. So, So the worm, C. elegans, is one of those models. And so it means that understanding a very simple system is obviously much quicker, it's much cheaper, it doesn't involve animal experimentation, but it means that you can apply the knowledge that you gain in a very simple organism to much more complicated organisms like ourselves. In your three-part series of lectures back in 2013, you focused on many questions, including, could I live forever? Can we talk a little bit about how close we are to being able to control the aging process? Mm. So I think that's an area of interest for lots of people, isn't it? We're, we're living in an ageing society and people are living a lot longer because we have drugs. So the really important ones would be antibiotics. They've kept us alive a lot longer and now we're starting to be able to treat cancers. And so people are living a lot longer. But the problem is that old age is still associated with a decrease in health. So there's lots of diseases that are associated with old age. Mm. And cancer is one of those, but there's also heart disease, neurodegeneration, arthritis, and all of those things which act together to make old age a rather unpleasant part of life for Mm. a lot of people. And so what scientists who are interested in aging are really focused on doing is extending what we call health span rather than lifespan. So we're not we're not trying to make people live for 200 years or more. We're trying to make the period of life the, the period of late life to be to have a much higher quality of of life for older people. Add to your wow factor with Michelle Martin in the Wow Club on 938 Live. Welcome to Wow or Women of Worth. My guest this evening is scientist Professor Alison Willard. Developmental biology is all about understanding this process of how one cell becomes 40 trillion cells all doing the right thing. Okay, And all of those 40 trillion cells have the same DNA. So the same genes are in all of our cells. So the problem is... And how do cells become different from one another? And the explanation for that is that genes can be switched on and off. Okay? And the the control is because other substances, proteins that are also encoded by genes, of course, come along and bind to the DNA and help make that decision whether you switch a gene on or switch a gene off. It's a bit like flicking a light switch. Mm. Okay? And what geneticists do is they often start with a mutant organism. So... An organism, it could be a, for me it would be a worm, but it could be a fly or a zebrafish, um, where there's a, 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 a defect in the DNA, a change in the DNA sequence, and that causes some aspect of development to go wrong. So maybe it could be a fly 
that in, that has uh, an abnormal number of wings, or it might have a leg instead of an antennae. That's that's something that's been described in flies. For a worm, it could be a worm that maybe doesn't have the nervous system working properly. Mm. So then what we try and do is to work out what gene has gone wrong in order to produce that disease state. And then when you've identified the gene that's gone wrong in that disease, you know that that gene must be really important in normal development for making those cells do the right thing, making the wing cells know when to stop, making the head cells of the fly produce antennae instead of legs, making the um, the worm nervous system work properly. And so those genes are likely to encode these switches that control whether genes are switched on or off. Amazing, really amazing. Uh, you're the fifth female scientist to be part of the Christmas lectures. Professor mm. Willard, what do you think of the representation of women in science? Oh, that's a really that's a really tricky problem, isn't it? I mean, it certainly seems that you have lots. There are lots of female science undergraduates, and there are quite a few, um, probably equal numbers of female graduate students. And as you go up the career ladder, it certainly seems that there are fewer and fewer women. So that's it's a problem in science, but it's a problem in everything. It's a problem in every institution, and it's a complicated problem. I don't really know what. Uh, what the real reason for that is and what the answers are. But one thing I would say is that I think what women need to do is to have the confidence to do what they want to do, to decide what they want to do and then just go for it. And there will be logistic problems, especially if you have kids. Um, But whatever problems there are, you have to think them through calmly and you find a solution and you move on. And the challenges. But women have such strengths, I think, in the workplace. You know, their ability to collaborate and to share, to work together is in many ways, you know, much, much, much better than what men do. And so women need to have confidence in their own abilities. More from my interview with Professor Alison Willard after this. Add to your wow factor with Michelle Martin in the Wow Club on 938 Live. She wows the crowd. My guest this evening in WOW is Professor Alison Woolard. So I think what we need to see now is an example of Mendelian uh, in, inheritance at work in a real animal. Oh, beautiful, different colours. Both got yes. short hair. And I understand that they're just like the boxes. And they've been yes. doing a little genetic project they all have. of their own. They have. And I think if we're lucky, we may even be able to see their babies. Look at these. Goodness me, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to have a little hold. And this one, this little baby here, has got long hair. So we've got how many kittens have we got all together here? There's eight. <gasps> eight. And when were they born? They're eleven weeks old. Oh, aren't they gorgeous? They've got gorgeous ears. And how many of them have got long hair? Three. Three long hair and the rest are short hair, just like mum and dad. And so this is very much like the balls that we were looking at before, isn't it? So the long hair kittens would be like the yellow, the yellow balled organism. And the short haired kittens, calling for mum, the short haired kittens could be like the blue or the mixture of the blue and the yellow. Can I, can I keep one? <laughs> absolutely gorgeous. And of course, the other thing we've got going on here is the assortment of these coat colour genes, haven't we? That's Professor Alison Woolard as the Royal Institution's Christmas lecturer back in 2013, explaining complex questions from how human beings begin as single fertilised cells and become trillions of highly specialised cells all within 40 weeks of gestation, or how her model organism, a one millimetre long nematode worm, begins as a single cell and grows to 959 cells. She takes complex scientific questions and simplifies them so even even children can walk away understanding science. More of my interview with Professor Alison Willard now in WOW. What do you think will help improve the representation in science, technology, engineering or maths? You don't think it's an issue of interest at all, right? Do you think it is? 
that, that little girls culturally um, move away from science and tech and engineering and maths? I don't think that's so much of a problem. If you, if I look at, well, in the biological sciences, no, I don't think it is because I look at, I look around in the lecture theatres as you know, there's there's half or more than half are women. It may be more of a problem in 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 physics and maths, and in those subjects, I think it's a case of engagement early on um, and good role models as well. I think exposing girls to successful physicists, successful, particularly engineering. There's some really great women role models out there in engineering. And getting them to talk to girls, I think I think role models are a really, really powerful way forward. Absolutely. I mean, if we just go back to you at age 12, looking at these Christmas lectures and being inspired by mm. what you saw, yeah, yeah. I can imagine a 12-year-old in the audience looking at you and being inspired mm. by what she sees. Mm. Tell us a little bit about this idea of balancing work and life. You mentioned even mm. when you know you, you were uh, offered the... Um, the uh, the chance to develop these lectures, you, you thought a little bit about how this would impact your life at home. Mm. So how do you manage work-life balance? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> it's very difficult and and it doesn't always work perfectly. So you, you can't strive for perfection, I think, as a as a working mother. You have to you have to sort of coexist with a bit of chaos. You have to have a sense of humor. That's really important. And you have to have a supportive network around you whether that's friends, parents, your partner, can be lots of different things. But I think it's really true, the old saying that it takes a village to bring up a child. And, you know, I, I borrow from my village quite a lot. And, <laughs> and the kids love it too, you know. Uh, so and, and making your kids feel really, really important and central, not, not making your life all about you mm. as a working person, but really centering your life. Don't change the centre of your life. Your kids are the really important things. And... And that mustn't change. So you get your, you know, you try to involve your kids in your work a little bit. I sometimes take mine into the lab and they, they just love it. And then it becomes... How old are they? Um, so I've got two girls. Uh, one is seven and one is 11. And they love coming into the lab and looking at worms. And, so they're showing but, leanings towards science then? Well, I don't know about that. They like to play <laughs> in the lab. My eldest daughter learned to walk um, car- by using a, a big uh, liquid nitrogen tank, which is a great, it's kind of like a great big fridge on wheels. And she kind of used that as a baby walker, which is quite shocking for me. But I, I thought she was sitting in the corner playing with toys. But no, she was learning to walk. So, yeah, it's, th- it's little adjustments like that. Uh, what's, what, what keeps you going in your career? finding out new things so that's the lure for a scientist is just to you know not every day but every few days to see something that no one else has ever seen and it might not be a big eureka moment it might not be going to change the world it might not be massively significant but it's something that you've never seen before and that you know that no one else has ever seen before and you've just noticed something it could be really small but that's that's the that's the excitement that's the adrenaline you're a terrific presenter. You communicate so beautifully with an audience. Has that always come naturally to you or has the Christmas lectures changed your presentation style? Do you know, lots of people ask me this question and I, I don't really know what makes a good good presentation. So I, I kind of think it must be something that's instinctive. It's fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Such a pleasure to speak with you, Professor Willard. Thank you very much. Dr. Willard's lecture, which headlined the Science Festival Star Lecture Series, will be broadcast on Channel 5 on the 14th of September, Sunday from 5.30pm to 7pm. This has been Wow! or Women of Worth. I'm Michelle Martin. Add to your Wow Factor with Michelle Martin in the Wow Club on 938 Live.